Welcome to r slash pro revenge, where a stupid boss is on the hook for a quarter of a million dollars. Our next Reddit post is from Deleted. So one summer at university, I took a job in the marketing department of a small manufacturing company, ostensibly creating foreign language advertisement material and safety texts, as well as all the social media stuff for their upcoming move to Europe. It quickly became clear that a large element of sales was involved, but I didn't mind. I was young and I wanted lots of big wins for my resume. The department consisted of myself, another guy for another European language, and one hugely underpaid 16-year-old junior intern. We all worked for an absolute douchebag, the boss, who basically had no relevant experience or competencies, but was a smooth talker and had ensnared the company owner in some kind of evil wizardry. This boss spent most of his time running a side business off of his iPhone only stopping to literally throw things at us whenever we were on the phone, to randomly paint the inside of our office jet black, ceiling included, or make inane demands like trying to force a supplier to give us a 40% discount based on our tiny firm's potential. This was all fine and kind of funny, and it gave us something to laugh about at KFC during lunch. But the real pain in the butt was that whenever anyone made any real headway, he would steal the credits. The owner never caught on, and genuinely thought that this guy was a one-man powerhouse, despite us occasionally leaving evidence or outright telling the owner that we'd done the work, and catching the boss out in some blatant lies. But it was all just miscommunication in the owner's eyes. This went on for months. We interns were all on minimum wage or lower, while basically doing the boss's job for him as he repeatedly told us how great he was and how little we understood. We spent the summer confusing the hell out of European CEOs and purchasing directors, who wondered why this mad little English company was using interns for its international business. The other marketing guy got tired of this and quit, leaving just me and the junior intern, at which point I was told that I'd been promoted to lead the project for both countries. At this point, I was now on part-time minimum wage, entrusted with planning and executing a foreign market invasion for two different countries, solo while the boss sold dildos on his iPhone. Oh, by the way, his side hustle was a sex shop. Even that would have been alright by me if the boss hadn't kept trying to steal credits. At one point, he jumped into a foreign language call that I was making to a well-circulated magazine and said, in English, I'll take over, OP isn't really that important, before promptly realizing that the other person on the phone was about 60 years old, partially deaf, and spoke about four words of English. He handed the phone back to me, then went off to tell the owner that he had just landed a great rate on an ad in a magazine. Because of my boss's stupid stunts, our vendors smelled weakness, and they would propose lopsided contracts which would mean that if we didn't sell a certain volume, we would be liable to pay the vendor pure cash for the remainder. This quota that we had to hit was 250,000 euros in the first 12 months. I had never heard of such a proposal before, and even at 19, I knew that it was all kinds of shady. This was the first thing that I was perfectly happy to let the boss take credit for. There was no way we'd make that quota. But the clueless boss was so thrilled to have a big number to throw around that he printed the contract there and then. The contract had been mailed to me, but he instantly claimed that he had arranged it, the absolute turnip. Now for the pro-revenge. He asked what I thought of the contract and whether we could achieve it. What I didn't say was that only a world champion village idiot would sign this contract. I did not say that only an absolute dildo vendor would go ahead with this blatantly disastrous contract without first consulting the owner. As my boss made it very clear, he is a marketing god and I was a lowly intern whose opinion was no more used than a chocolate teapot. So, <laughs> rather than warning him that this contract was so horrible that we should burn the paper that it was printed on and have the office exercise to be safe, I instead said simply, You're the boss. The numbers are all in the project book if you want to read it over, but if it looks good to you, the post office closes in 15 minutes. I knew without a shadow of a doubt that he wouldn't bother with my boring paperwork. Not when I had dangled a chance for him to get this big win dispatched by the end of business day. And sure enough, he said there was no need to see my figures because he had done the sums himself and he was certain that it was solid gold. 
Funnily enough, the project book that I had mentioned quite clearly showed that I had estimated at most 20,000 in sales if we were lucky. So less than 10% of what we were required to sell. But alas, anything written by me wasn't worth reading, not with the post office closing in 15 minutes. So he signed the contract and sent me running off to send it in the post. I made copies and then mailed it off to our lucky new vendors. I then took a copy straight to the owner, told the owner the project book was in the boss's office if he wanted to check the numbers, and then went to the HR next door to regretfully hand in my notice before shifting it out of there before the fireworks started. So, at the start of the next day, the boss was called to a meeting with the owner. Yelling was heard. About an hour later, the bosses walked off the property, and a hastily typed out email is sent out reminding people that only the owner and HR are authorized to sign contracts. Unfortunately, the contract was still apparently valid because the boss's title, marketing director, gave him implied authority or something. I'm not a lawyer, and all I did during my final week was hang out at KFC with the other surviving intern. So, I wasn't at any board meetings, shockingly. But the company lawyer was there every day that week, and last I heard, the ex-boss was being sued by the company for the damages, which were potentially 250,000 euros. I doubt that his dildo dealership made enough to cover his legal fees. Our next Reddit post is from Spongebob No Pants. I work in the private security field. Not mall cops, but highly trained and skilled armed security. We worked residential buildings and complexes that were very high-end. Like $200,000 cars in the parking garages high-end. Now, places like these are Karen Central. Imagine apartments full of Karens and entitled teenagers. Now, the company owner was awesome. He was a cop as his regular job, so he understood what we faced. His advice was to be nice, but to put the hammer down if you have to, and to not take their garbage. So each supervisor had 10 to 15 properties under their control. Regular officers patrolled these properties, but we were in charge of helping with evictions, attending town halls on security issues, deciding how an officer patrols, or updating what areas are being a problem or need to be checked on. I had 12 properties. Now, in this one apartment complex, we had a couple who was always calling us. Whenever we got there, they would cry about their upstairs neighbor. The list went on and on. Stomping, music, talking, cooking smells, their dog going number one on the balcony and it dropping onto theirs. These were all valid complaints, if we found evidence, but we never did. When they realized that we were starting to question if their complaints were valid, they changed their tactics and went racist. The couple above them were a sweet and wonderful middle-aged Asian couple. The husband was an immigrant, but the wife was born and raised American. These racist Cretans had only talked to the husband, so they assumed, as all racists do, that they were both immigrants. So this white sheet-wearing couple started making comments like, those Asians, and they're in America, why can't they cook American food? And I'm afraid to be in the parking garage when one of them is driving in it. And while these comments angered me, they weren't alone enough for an eviction. The only thing I could do was have my officers put down the exact phrasing in the report. I did ask the property manager about the comments, and she said that if the racist neighbors didn't actually say them to the residents, and the residents didn't complain, there wasn't much she could do. So I tried to think of some way to get this racist couple evicted. Not only were they lying to get an innocent couple evicted, but they were calling in false things and wasting our time to respond. And they didn't call just every once in a while. They sometimes called twice in one night, usually five to eight times a week. So a month later, the opportunity was handed to me. The Asian couple called me during the day and informed me that they were going out of the country to China for two weeks and no one would be in their apartment. They told me this in case the other couple started complaining, then I would know that they were lying. And they also asked me to check their door once a night to make sure that it was locked and not broken into. I informed the Asian couple to not tell their neighbor or anyone else except for security. We had a patrol meeting that night. Officers didn't work in one specific region, so I told them all my plan. I wanted my officers to respond to every single complaint from this racist couple and also to write down exactly what they said happened and also any racial terms no matter how minor. So away we go. During those 14 days, they complained 18 times. 
Everything was documented and I took it to the manager. She looked it over and said, let's evict them. So in this situation, me, the property manager, and the racist tenant sit down at a table. We read them the charges for eviction. Since the evictions related to security, I explained to them what violations had been broken. These were not my opinions. They were facts based on the reports which the tenants got a copy of. After that, the tenants had the right to speak and ask questions. Finally, the property manager then decides what happens next, if they can stay or if they have to be evicted. So they were sent a formal letter stating they were facing eviction and they had 10 days to set up this meeting. If not, the eviction would be processed. They set up the meeting. I get there and this racist couple and the manager are already present. The wife immediately digs into me because I was armed. Uniforms for those situations are a dress shirt, slacks, tie, and one weapon and one magazine. I just politely informed her that this was my uniform and it wasn't her call to make. She tried to say that she felt uncomfortable and wanted to reschedule, but the manager said this happens now or I will evict you, so they agreed to continue. Now, for legal reasons, these sessions were recorded by video. That way, the tenant can't lie in eviction court or sue. In front of me were all 18 reports, and we went over each one, the time, the date, and who called. I also read out each line of the report and asked them which part of this is false and which part is true. The only thing they said was false were the racial slurs. So after each line, I'd clarify, you're saying that the part of the report about the neighbor playing music too loud is accurate, but the part about you saying racial slurs is not accurate. They would say yes every time. After about the seventh one of these, I think the wife caught on. She started complaining that I was dragging it out. I just smiled politely and reminded her that this was my turn to speak, and she had ample opportunity to object and ask me questions, but only after I was done. Then, after I was done getting them to admit to their lies, I told them that their neighbors were actually out of the country at the time of those 18 reports, and that the tenants provided proof that they were gone, and my officers checked the apartment one time a night and confirmed that it was empty. Then, I smiled pleasantly and ended my speaking role, but the look on their face was a mix of anger and fear. They didn't have a defense. Basically, they said that me and the manager were choosing immigrants over Americans. Oh, <laughs> did I mention the manager is an immigrant? That went over like a hand grenade in a collection plate. Once they said that, the manager stopped the interview and told them that she was an immigrant too. That just made matters worse because they said that she was just taking up for her own kind. During this time, I'm calm and collected. Inside my mind, I'm thinking, oh shit. After a few more racial remarks, the manager just stopped them and said, you're guilty. And she said that she would process the eviction paperwork with the courts in the morning. Long story short, they were given 14 days. From what I heard, the judge originally gave them 30 days, but knocked it down to 14 after they called him a racial slur. I was able to call the nice Asian couple and let them know that it was over, and they didn't have to worry because we would no longer respond to calls about their apartment for the next 14 days until the eviction came through and the bad tenants left. But they were welcome to call anytime if they need help or if they have any issue. Security officers want to help so bad, but were limited by either laws, property management rules, or both, so it was nice to do some good. Man, I would have loved to have been in the room for that exchange. Don't you just hate immigrants? To the woman who literally is an immigrant. <laughs> Our next Reddit post is from Chelator. My landlord was a terrible human being. Honestly, calling him a human is even pushing it. This is just a few things that he's done to me over the past three years. He stole my dryer and other household products that are in the common area. He made me pay for a plumbing repair, which was deemed as normal wear and tear. He tried breaking into my house. He retaliated against me because I went to my lawyer after he sent me a letter about a parking spot. He had tried charging me an extra $150 a month for it. Mind you, I was never late for rent in three years, except for when he made me pay for the plumbing repair. So the next month, I was a couple of days late. The list goes on, and this apartment was nowhere near nice. I found out the plumbing was illegal. He left me with a porch for years that has severe safety issues. The ceiling paint was always falling down, the gas heater wasn't up to code, and so on. I finally got the chance to leave after he wanted to raise my rent 500 bucks a month. He would do anything and everything to get more money out of his tenants. So I called the building inspector four days before I left. I told him everything. 
The porch, which the owner had finally replaced, didn't have a permit and was definitely not up to code. I told the inspector about the plumbing and the heater issues. I went on and on. The inspector came over the very next day, and I saw him taking measurements. Each violation is a $500 a day fine until it's fixed. I don't know what happened, but my god did it feel good to finally get him back. He is, at the very least, on the town's radar now. A week before I moved out, he tried telling me that I needed to be out at a specific time. I never responded, and where I live, that's how it works. He tried to threaten me with the police if I wasn't gone. Well, I went to the police myself that morning to warn them. The landlord did come by, threaten me, and harass me. I called the police, and they informed him that I was in the right. Long story short, while I was away at storage, he had broken into my apartment while I was gone. He nailed my door shut. I told the cops to get their supervisor because I was over being harassed by this guy. Go figure, he left before the supervisor could get there. I'm positive he knew that he'd be arrested on sight. I got the police report, and they're charging him with a felony for breaking and entering. So he got daily fines and a felony charge. You know what would be super funny is if the cops arrested him and threw him in jail, and then for like the, I don't know, however many days or weeks or months he's in jail, all those $500 a day fines are just racking up, getting higher and higher and higher. That was r slash pro revenge, and if you like this content, check out my podcast where I publish the exact same episodes. Also, hit that subscribe button because I put out new Reddit videos every single day.